So as Britt said, I am an alum of the program, and so when I was when Krell asked me to give me give this talk, they asked me to talk about HPC from an applications perspective. And I don't know whether we're going to hit that mark or not. I hope we do. Um, but what I really did was I tried to put myself in the shoes of our entering fellows, our brand new fellows who uh, are coming to visit us for the first time, and tried to remember what it was like when I was sitting there, um, having come to this conference. You know, I'll be honest, I had imposter syndrome. I listened to all the fourth year fellows, and I didn't know a lot about what they were talking about. It went, a lot of it went way over my head. I heard all this stuff about computation, um, and I hadn't really done any computation before. So what I've tried to do today is take kind of a 40,000 foot uh, view of applications and how as an application developer, I think about the computational science pro process. And Rob's given us a really good detailed introduction to architectures. Uh, we'll rely on some of what he's talked about today um, and hopefully kind of build from that and how as application, as domain scientists, applied mathematicians and computer scientists, how we might take those architectures and use them to their fullest utility. So you'll have to tell me afterwards whether I've hit the mark or not. Okay, but first, I wanna ask some questions of you. So be prepared today to be interactive. I'm gonna ask lots of questions and I'd like to, to spur some discussion on. So I would like to know who's a new fellow. Raise your hands. So maybe a third of us or so are new fellows. Who is here for the second time so has just completed their first year in the program? A few more. Second year fellows. So good, I'm glad you're, I'm, I'm glad that this session, you thought this would be useful for, to you compared to the advanced session, so I'm glad you're here. So now, and except for what we heard this morning from Rob's talk, who's heard of MPI in here? Excellent, a good number of us. So when I was sitting in your shoes, I had not heard of MPI. Um, that was, I don't want to admit it, but that was 15 years ago. Uh, so times have changed. Who has actually programmed with MPI? Lesser number of us, but still a good number. OpenMP or uh, some other threading, still a good number, good. CUDA or other, wow. Okay, so as an Oak Ridge person, you know, for this talk I'm trying to take my Oak Ridge hat off, but with my Oak Ridge hat on, yay! Um, I'm glad to hear that, that that's excellent news. So with that perspective, we have a lot of knowledge that that you're gonna need. So some of this may be a little bit too basic for you, but what I really want to do is talk from a much higher perspective and talk about the things that as computational scientists we're gonna need to be successful. So I have a few ground rules for this discussion. The first of which is we're not going to embark on religious discussions. Um, especially at this con conference, we can, we can get pretty um, we can have a lot of battles of the wills, can't we? I mean, we're all very smart people. Um, we're very passionate about what we do. Um, let's leave some of that passion, at least when it comes to um, more semantic things, let's leave that at the door. So um, we're not gonna talk about VI versus Emacs. If you haven't made that decision, the right answer is VI. Um, <laughs> th those of you that use Emacs, you'll see the light one of these days. Um, we're not gonna talk about whether GPUs are better than mini core or better than some other architecture that you care a lot about. Doesn't matter for this discussion. Doesn't matter what language you choose to program in. Okay, next, questions, interruptions, discussion, highly encouraged today. I would rather we not get through my slides and we actually talk about what it, what it means to us to be a computational scientist and to do computing in our domain applications. And I only have an hour probably not even an hour at this point, probably more like 55 minutes. So uh, there's lots of topics we could talk about. There's some I've chosen to talk about. Um, if there was something that, that I missed, I hope you'll tell me. So now, so I, I promised I was gonna talk about the toolbox we all need to be successful as computational scientists. So the first assumption you should make is I'm not claiming to be successful. Um, I'm hoping that, again, as someone who has sat in your seat, these are the kinds of things that I now think about and have thought about over the last 15 years, so I'm hoping this will be something um, that helps you start your path towards being a computational scientist, gives you some of the tools and terminology that you're gonna need. Um, second, I've never given this talk. This, you guys are a really hard audience to talk to because you're so bright, you have such wide uh, variety of applications that we work on, 
You know, every one of us does something completely different. So this is a very different conference, as I'm sure you found out, to attend. It's also a very hard audience to talk to. So you should assume that my backgrounds in numerical methods, applied math, and PDEs, a lot of the examples I'm gonna give you are from that background. Those of you that are from the information sciences, bioinformatics people, my apologies. Um, I'm not as familiar with your area as I would like to be. So you'll, some, of these some of these examples may be a little bit different or maybe from a different perspective than you might have in your work. Okay. Okay, so our goal is to define a successful computational scientist. What does that mean? This is where I'm looking at you guys. What, what do you think it means to be a successful computational scientist? And I know names, so I'm gonna call on people. So be prepared. Jamie. <laughs> See, I knew a name. So use computing to answer a scientific question. Excellent. Anything else? What else can you think of that it might mean to be a successful computational scientist? Okay. So use computing effectively. Okay. Anything else? So I'll be honest. We're going to come back to this. I don't have the answer right now. So hopefully over the course of the next hour, maybe we'll come to some agreement on what it is. But first of all, we have to define it. And I think at least in this room, we all can define this. Um, for many of my lay people who, you know, when I go out into the world and they say, what do you do? You know, I love it, you go to the doctor's office. So what do you do? Well, I'm a computational scientist. Uh, there's dead silence, right? So computational science, to me at least, you can disagree, is that intersection between computer science, mathematics, and some scientific domain or engineering domain. We're trying to live at that intersection. That's a challenging intersection to live at. We need a lot of tools to be able to competently address all three of those areas. Okay, so I like to think of computational science as a process. And independent of the application domain, which you have chosen to go into, you're probably going to address something that looks like this process in your career. You're probably going to, if we start up in the upper left hand, do I have a pointer? I do. If we start in the upper left hand corner, you're probably going to have some kind of real world problem, some kind of scientific question that you want to answer. That could be I'm trying to design some molecule to do something or some polymer to do something in particular. It could be I'm trying to answer um, a question about climate science, what the effect of um, some physical, pro physical or chemical process in the atmosphere is on the broader climate impact. It could be something in material science where I'm trying to design some material to do something in particular. So we start with that real world, world problem, right? And then we simplify that and come up with some kind of working model because let's go back to climate science. If I'm trying to model the climate, I'm probably not going to model every individual blade of grass out there, am I? I would, you know, even in the exascale era, era that Rob just talked about, every blade of grass probably isn't possible. You know, even with all the computing power in the world, if we put it all together, it's still not gonna happen. So we have to come up with some working model, and then we have to represent it with some mathematical model, um, or statistical model, depending on our field. Then we have to come up with some computational representation because unfortunately, in my you know, naive brain, I would love to take a mathematical model and just hand it to my computer and out pop an answer, right? Wouldn't that make all of our lives a lot easier if I could just you know, say, you know, computer recognize this PDE for me and solve it, preferably at this level of accuracy like we just said. So I have to come up with some implementation, then I have to actually simulate, get some results, and I think the, one of the most important aspects of being a computational scientist is this interpret. Um, take the results of our simulation and determine whether what we got out of that simulation actually matches what we see in the real world and what we need to change about our model, improve about our model, um, what should be different. So what I like to do is I like to say there are three A's that every computational scientist needs to do or needs to have. They need to have an application. I think most of us, even us applied mathematicians in here, we have an application. Um, if you're a mathematician, math is your application. Um, so that's the scientific problem of interest. We need to have an algorithm, the numerical or mathematical representation to solve that problem. 
And then we're very fortunate, Rob has told us all about architectures, but we have to have some way to solve that problem, some architecture on which to solve that problem. So today we're gonna to talk in very broad terms about things you, as a beginning computational scientist, you might think about in each of these different A's. But I lied. You know, when I wrote my abstract, I said there were three A's. Then I thought about it more over the last couple of weeks, and there's actually a fourth A, which is analysis, that interpret that I just said. We have to take the results of our simulations and we have to analyze them and interpret them and compare them to experiments and observations. Okay, so if I map that back onto my broad computational science process, it, it really maps quite well. If I take um, a real world problem and I turn it into a working model, I consider that our application, our scientific domain. If I then represent that as a mathematical model and even a computational model, that's our algorithm. When I simulate it, I'm using an architecture. And then when I interpret it, I'm using our analysis. So, a, so I'm going to say one thing. A successful computational scientist is probably going to address this entire life cycle, this entire process of, be, of computational science. So to be successful, I'll get to you in just a second. To be successful, in my opinion, I think you have to at least address or have recognition about this entire process. Now what I think is interesting is if you look at your program of study that we're all taking, it's really designed to address all of this. We all have scientific and engineering classes we have to take, that's our application. We have mathematics classes, that's our algorithms, and we have computer science classes. Well, and our mathematics classes could also be our analysis classes. We have computer science classes that address kind of these architecture questions. You had a question, yes. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> what do you think the role of a uh, computational scientist should be in data collection? Data, data collection. That is a good question. Define, so is data collection experiments? Um, Tell me experimental stuff. What they should do, should we do some experiments? That, that's a really interesting, that's, a, that's a, a very broad question and a really interesting one. I think, many computational scientists, not all, will work hand in hand with experimentalists. I think that's a very, that's an increasingly important part of the computational science process, which is this interpret. We're beginning, you know, in the last 10 years with predictive analysis. So we do these predictive simulations where we assume, make some assumptions on our input conditions and we simulate. If we don't have experimental data to compare to, what's the value of our, our simulation? Does that mean that we should be experimentalists ourselves? I think in some cases, some people will be. Um, in this program, I would say we're more focused on trying to train the computational side because experimentalists have had 60 to 80 years to, or longer. You know, you could even go back to Newton's time and say he was an experimentalist. He did lots of observations, right? Um, we've had lots of training in that, um, but I think we do have to be cognizant of experiments and what's being done in that realm and collaborate with those people at the very least. I saw another hand, yes. No, um, I think that that's also, so as I said, I'm a very, this is going to be a very 40,000 foot um, um, view of this process. I think you can use simulation a very broad term. You can, data analysis is, I would still consider data analysts to be, you know, that's a growing field with big data. I think that that has come into the computational science realm. I think mathematicians could be computational mathematicians and they live in this life cycle. Being, a, in my opinion, so I have to ca clarify this, all of this is my opinion, um, a computational si scientist is someone who is cognizant of this entire process. Now, we all in this room are probably going to have breadth across this, but we're gonna have areas on this process where we have a lot more depth, okay? But part of, part of the purpose of this program is educating us around this entire, um, this entire cycle, and that gives at least I've found in my career, having that breadth across the entire process and the entire life cycle has given me a lot of value. I've brought a lot of perspectives to each part of this process. Did I see another hand? Okay. Please, do interrupt me. I, I was quite, quite serious on that. Okay, so. So let's start with talking again, high level, about applications and some of the pitfalls that I have run into as a, as a computational scientist when it came to applications. So 
One question people often ask me, so part of being a computational scientist, let me back up a little bit, is the ability to communicate what we're doing. A lot of people, and we've talked about that, I think, throughout the, this um, conference with the poster session, with the emphasis on the, the criticism that some of the alums have given or feedback alums have given on the posters. We really value communication. That was something when I came into this program I didn't know anything about. Didn't know that I needed to be able to talk not only to my peers in this room, but to people outside about the value of computational science. And so in my current job, I ask, I'm often asked, why, why should I care about high performance computing? What, what is it doing for me as a computational scientist that I can't do on my local workstation? Or that, you know, 100 years ago I couldn't do with a pen and paper? Why should we be using high performance computing? So computational simulation allows, offers us the ability to enhance as well as leapfrog theoretical and experimental progress in many areas of science and engineering. That's from the SCALES report from 2003, I believe. I think many of you had to read this for your application to CSGF. If you haven't read it, or even if you have read it, I recommend you go back and reread it. I think there's a lot of valuable information in this, um, in this report. But in that case, you know, in any case, all of the applications that we represent in here have need for computing, and many of them have need for high performance computing. Just a few examples are advanced energy, energy systems, so fusion, for example, example. The fusion program for the Department of Energy is putting a lot of money into a, an international pro project in France called ITER, which is an experimental project. However, the value of simulation is it's helped drive, driving some of the design of that construction site, as well as interpreting, eventually when ITER is fully built, we'll interpret some of the results that are coming out of it, helping us better understand what's going on in the fusion process. Biotechnology, so for, some of you, for those of you that are in the bio field, there's lots of work in genomics and cellular dynamics, among others, that make use of HPC, um, uh, the HPC facilities. Environmental modeling, that's a hot topic these, er these days. Climate prediction and pollution remediation makes use of HPC, as well as nan nanotechnology and material science. But why in particular should we be interested in HPC or in simulation in general? It's because in many cases, I stole this slide, I don't see David here this morning, from David Keyes, borrowed is a better word, I guess. I borrowed this, this slide from our colleague David Keyes, um, who's a, a great friend of this program, who talks about the imperative of, of simulation. And the imperative of simulation is that experiments are often controversial, they're often ex ex expensive, they can be dangerous, they can be prohibited, as in the case of our weapons stewardship program. Um, they can be difficult. There are all sorts of reasons why experiments are challenging. And with the, val the value of computation, um, in particular HPC computation, is that we're, it enables us to do some of these, ex these computational experiments, these computational studies that help inform our ex the experiments, help us replace experiments, help complement experiments. So it's really kind of this, another leg of the scientific process. So, what are some of the challenges that we as computational scientists face? So I talked a bit about climate. I'm go, gonna go back to the climate example again. So one common pitfall that I often make when I put my applied mathematics hat on is I take an, an example problem. So in this case, we're gonna look, we look at, at climate. So climate has all sorts of physical and chemical process. There's atmospheric dynamics. There's the effect of the ocean. There's the effect of the land cover. Um, there's effect of, the effect of sea ice and glaciers. All these effects are quite common. So I talk in broad terms, of, you know, as my applied mathematician about climate, how I'm helping solve a climate problem, and then I turn it into my favorite equation, which is just the heat equation, or even worse, Poisson, which is just Laplace's equation. So ignore this time-dependent problem. Well, as a mathematician, that's perfectly fine. I'm probably looking at numerical methods and trying to help downstream computational scientists better solve their problems. But if I were a domain scientist making this simplification, and admittedly this is a huge overgeneralization, I don't know climate scientists that actually do this. Um, I like to communicate in um, exaggeration. But too much simpli simplification can lead to an unrealistic model. So we have to guard against that. Um, trusting the results, if I were to do this, trusting the results that the, the results of this equation have anything to do with this phenomena, probably not gonna happen. And when I try and communicate that to my colleagues, not gonna, the best result is probably, uh, I won't get the result I'm looking for. However, this is the one I see made more often. So this is a cartoon. 
Um, and what it says down here is what exactly are we saying here? Or I like to say what exactly are we seeing here? I will often see computational, computational scientists that will put up this massive model, all these different coupled equations, and then they have a difficulty interpreting the results. Now, I'm not saying that those huge predictive simulations don't require this kind of simulation, this kind of equations, that mathematical representation. But when we're looking for effects, um, it's very, it can be difficult to, to interpret our results, or to correctly interpret our results. So this is something to also guard against. Also, when you're building a model, um, starting here, not recommended. If, once we get to the implementation phase, think about debugging that. So I have my mathematical model that's 20 pages long, and then I immediately start from scratch and try and implement that. Um, when I make a mistake, it's not if, but when I make a mistake, finding that mistake after I've implemented 20 pages of equations, not very much fun. You can spend a lot of time looking for those mistakes. So build on, you know, you're gonna want to do building blocks. That's all I'm gonna say about applications, and I did that intentionally, because over the last two days, we've heard a lot about applications from our fourth year fellows as well as from our keynote speakers. So you've been exposed to a broad range of applications today. What I wanna talk about now is we've taken our, our real world problem, and we've simplified it down into something, and now how are we gonna solve that something? So if I took a survey of all the applications represented in here, there would probably be an equal number of algorithms that were discussed here. So this is, you know, I struggled a lot with this topic. How was I going to introduce algorithmic perspective from the 40,000 foot view where something, everyone could take something away from it? Again, we'll see how I do. So we've chosen this mathematical problem. I've gone back to my favorite heat equation. And how are we actually going to approach solving that problem? So the equation here doesn't matter. Put your favorite equation in here, your favorite problem. Um, it, the, the particulars here don't, aren't important. What I want to communicate is that high-end simulation in the physical sciences, again, notice I'm leaving out, unfortunately, the bioinformatics type people, um, can be represented by a few computational patterns. These computational patterns are things like dense linear algebra. So dense linear algebra is when I'm trying to solve a system of equations AX equals B, and A is completely dense. So A is a matrix, X is a vector, and I'm, I'm looking for X equals some right-hand side B. A is dense. So dense linear algebra is often found in physical simulations. Sparse linear algebra, so I'm trying to solve the same equations, but A is sparse. So A, which means A has lots of, not, lots of zeros inside of it. Um, fast Fourier, Fourier transforms are something a lot of people use. Particle methods, so again, going back to the fusion example, um, um, as well as other application areas, you can also often extract out a particle type method. Monte Carlo or stochastic type approaches. Structured grids and meshes or un unstructured grids and meshes. Now, I didn't come up with this list. I should point that out. This is the, um, these, these computational, what I like to call motifs, were actually proposed back in 2004 by Phil Colella from Berkeley Laboratory. And the, the choice of <coughs> motifs isn't important. In fact, these cho the choice of these motifs were driven by what he knew in terms of physical simulation or predictive simulation. The, the list has been, has grown, has been changed over the years. Propo people have proposed additional motifs, people have proposed modifications to these, these mo motifs. What's really important is in defining these types of computational motifs, you're looking for commonalities between computation and communication, you're looking for patterns. And these patterns um, are, are useful because they help, they're well-defined, they're well-defined algorithmic targets. So why do you care? You know, I've talked about these very common computational motifs, why do you care? Well first, this is important for CSGF, this kind of computational pattern, these kind of algorithms, give you the opportunity to talk between disciplines. They're common across many disciplines. So if you can break a system of equations, your application down to equations, and then down to these computational kernels, it gives someone from material science, for example, the opportunity to talk to someone from nuclear physics and say, oh, there's commonality here. Again, one of the benefits of, of this type of program where we can talk across those domains. It gives me, as an applied mathematician, the ability to talk to a climate scientist or a fusion scientist about something like this. The other second most important thing um, that I wish I had known when I sat in your seat 
was these motifs define building blocks for creating libraries that ca cross cut the application domains. So as you, as you advance in your career and you're starting to build your simulations, you want to use lots of the scientific libraries that have already been developed, so don't reinvent the wheel. So for example, if I look at these, these computational motifs, there are software packages, in particular, these have all been developed at the DOE laboratories, where you can use some of these, many of these algorithms have already been developed, or already been implemented for you. So for dense linear algebra, Scalapack um, is a very common package. For sparse linear algebra, Petsy and Trilinos are very common. This list is not all encompassing. The message is make use of the infrastructure that's already been developed. Talk to your colleagues here, find out what they use. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. Okay. But more, I shouldn't say more, I was about to say more importantly, These, these computational motifs allow us to talk between each other, talk about algorithms and methods um, amongst a, a wide variety of computational scientists, but they actually serve a very important person purpose to me, to people like Rob, um, and those of us in the laboratories who are, very tied, who are tied very closely to our large machines. Um, these motifs help me define a minimum set of functionality, some algorithms that I want to make sure run on our big machines. So I use them as well in my, my domain. So when we were putting together Titan, so you'll hear about Titan in the next step, next session. Um, when we were putting together Titan, we actually looked at these motifs and made sure that we had code coverage across these motifs so that we knew that those types of algorithms ran well on Titan. So that's important in terms of preparing architectures. Um, the second reason when I put my applied mathematics hat back on is by having these kind of computational motifs it decouples me as an applied mathematician away from some of the application domains where I can do my research on numerical methods that still has impact downstream to the computational, the domain scientists without having to be fully embedded all the time. It's still important for me to be embedded in their simulation codes, but it's important for me to also abstract out so I can do my own research. Okay. So, that's all I need to know about algorithms, right? We've just covered at the 40,000 foot view. Not really, we're actually gonna tie cl more closely to what Rob talked about earlier today, where we had algorithms and architecture. So we've talked about these computational kernels, but I haven't really talked about them in the case of high performance computing and how we take this numerical method. So we've taken, we've taken our application, we've abstracted out a mathematical model, we've somehow, Again, because we all do something very different, we've talked about, we've tried to abstract out computational kernels. Now, how do I actually implement that on an architecture? And we're gonna do this in about five slides, so hang on. So we're now gonna talk about the implementation of a numerical method on an architecture. So Rob talked a little bit about programming models, and I'm gonna touch on this as well. I actually wanna change this slightly. I wanna add something and I wanna change it. So um, programming models are the way in which we're gonna take that, that algorithm and implement it on our, our architecture. And the top level here might be the place where many of us start, MATLAB or Python or some interpreted language, serial, right? I'm gonna add another layer here, not in the slides, it didn't make it into the slides. So once I get to the point where MATLAB doesn't solve my needs, I've run my simulation and it no longer runs on my laptop and I've run my memory, run my laptop out of memory and MATLAB says, oh, I can't do it anymore. What do I do next? I implement it in C, so some kind of compiled language. Okay, that's great. There we go. Then, you know, again, so MATLAB takes a lot of memory. So I go to C. It still takes a lot of memory, so now I need to use multiple um, computers at a time, so I, I start implementing M MPI, because for many of us that came from the dark ages, we didn't have these multi-core architectures at our disposal. So we started with MPI rather than, MP, rather than the X, which we'll talk about in a minute. So I run on MPI and then I hit the, the memory per core issue that Rob talked about. So now I start doing MPI plus X, where X here is probably going to be some kind of threading model. So great. And then I finally get to some place like Titan at the OLCF where it's, we also have <laughs> GPUs at our disposal and so we start thinking about accelerator programming. So as you move down this stack of programming models, we're increasing in our programming complexity, as Rob talked about this morning. And we also have to increase in our exposed parallelism. Again, Rob talked about this this morning. I wanna take a step back 
and go or kind of fly back to the 40,000 foot view, remembering that when I was sitting in your, your seat, I didn't know how I might use MPI. So Rob talked this morning about MPI being message passing, where we take information from one processor and we send a message so that that data gets to another processor. Well, how might, what strategies might I use where I would want to employ some kind of message passing? So one strategy would be I have my, my computational domain with my mathematical equa equation here in, in my implementation, whether that be, say, finite elements or finite volumes or finite differences, whatever your favorite discretization might be. Um, and I want to divide it and send it to four different processors. So one strategy would be to use domain decomposition, where I slice this thing up and into four different, um, bot, different slices. Let me go back. So I want to do this when I've essentially run out of memory on my laptop, right? So I want to do some higher fidelity simulation or where time to solution is too long, I need the answer faster. So I slice it up and I send each of these slices to one of my nodes or CPUs as Rob talked about this morning. So this is the domain decomposition strategy. It's maybe the first strategy that you employ. But there's a second strategy where I might want to use MPI. Um, simulations, and that's the case, and we're seeing this a lot more in the leadership class facilities, where we want to do ensemble simulations, where ensemble simulations mean I have a whole lot of simulations I need to do where I'm just going to change one variable, so some kind of stochastic or some kind of Monte Carlo method where I'm doing sampling, um, some kind of uh, parameter sweep where I want to look at a suite of parameters, and they're ever so slightly different. So in that case, I'm going to use an, a naively parallel implementation. A lot of people, you might commonly hear this as embarrassingly parallel. Uh, at the scale at which we operate on Titan at, at Oak Ridge, nothing is embarrassing about running a simulation over 18,000 nodes with GPUs and stuff. So I prefer to use the word naive um, because many people think it's embarrassing and then they come to us and they realize how naive they were uh, to make this work. So like I said, this is generally used for parameter sweeps or ensembles, so I take the same simulation where I vary some parameter, in this case maybe this diffusion co coefficient in front of this variable here, or maybe some right-hand side or some reaction rate, and I run the, a very similar simulation across every one of my nodes. That's another case where you might want to use something like MPI. Well, what are some of the challenges you might encounter? So Rob talked this morning about memory per, per core. MPA, when you implement this way without some kind of thread model on top of it to use our multi-core threads or multi-cores, um, you have a limited amount of memory per node. Another challenge you can encounter is you increase the number of MPI ranks. Um, communication across the network or the interconnect can become quite contentious. Um, my recommendation there, design algorithms of, that avoid all-to-all -all communication. For, that's a little bit more advanced nugget, but those of you who are starting to get into these type of problems, you're going to want to look at something that where every MPI rank doesn't talk to every other MPI rank. That's generally considered um, not the greatest. It's a perfect place to start. It will work great on small machines, but as you scale up to much larger machines, you'll encounter some problems. Another challenge that I, I hinted about is that as your ensembles, as if you're doing parameter sweeps or ensemble simulations, as those become quite large, you want to do lots of those, your workflow can become quite difficult. Managing all those different parameter sweeps or pr parameter simulations that you want to do um, can become challenging. Where do I put the data? How do I know what I've run? How do I aggregate it all together? These are the kind of things you're going to want to think about. Okay. So then, so I've done my, you know, I've done my interpreted language, I've done my compiled language, I realized I needed to go to a much larger machine because I couldn't get my work done fast enough, so I did MPI, but now I've hit maybe one of these challenges, or I won't, you know, I haven't made use of all the, the cores available on the node. So then I'm gonna do something like shared memory programs. I'm gonna do MPI between the nodes. Um, so between each of these nodes here, I wanna do some kind of MPI. But then I want to do, I want some hybrid programming where I need to do shared, uh, some shared memory where I take advantage of all of these um, cores on every node. So I'm going to use some kind of P threads or OpenMP type impl implementation. Um, and every thread on the, on the node handles some subset of the calculations. Um, when you get to that point, so I should back up a little bit. There's an entire, I can give an entire talk on an MPI alone. I can probably give an entire talk on OpenMP or pthreads. So we're gonna leave it at that. And when you get to that point, 
Um, there are lots of resources available to help you understand how to use these directives. So, accelerator programs. So, yeah, I did my interpreted language, I did my compiled language, I did MPI, I did MPI plus X, now I'm ready for Titan. Or I'm ready for NERSC's new machine, Cori, that'll be coming out in a few years. So I'm ready for some kind of accelerator programming model. So in that case, this is, this is pretty much a repeat of what uh, Rob said this morning. I have these CPU cores that have their memory today. I have some kind of accelerator right now that could be a GPU, it could be an Intel mic, that has its own memory. Um, and I want to figure out how to program this. So there you're going to be looking for things like CUDA, OpenCL, OpenACC, OpenMP in the future. Um, and the challenge is there is that the cost of moving, moving data from this CPU, this is a little bit uh, misleading, this network connection goes to the CPU. So if I have an accelerator here that's crunching on a bunch of data and I need to send it down to this CPU, I have to send the data from the accelerator to the CPU across the network and back to the CPU and if I have to send it back to that accelerator, to the accelerator. So the cost of data movement becomes your bottleneck at that point. So that's something you'll want to keep in mind. And keeping the accelerator, accelerator fed, so making sure you have enough data for it to crunch on to take advantage of all those really free flops that we have is something you'll want to think about as well. Okay, so we've gone from an application, we've taken an algorithm, uh, we've made some architecture. I still have 20 minutes, which is excellent, I think. Is that about right? Excellent. Um, now, I need to analyze it, right? Because I'm not a computational scientist if I haven't done the whole sweep to go back and, and improve my thing. So analysis, in the context of big simulations can equal big data. It doesn't always equal big data. There are several application areas that don't generate a whole lot of data. My point here is that's a whole nother hour. It's, but it is an emerging topic that, that we, um, we at the DOE labs, I think some of our NSF sister facilities are very concerned about. So it's a topic that we've started hearing a lot about in the last two years. I think we'll continue to hear about it in the next couple of years. So my recommendation there is in your program of study, data analysis courses will become increasingly important. So in, in, uh, even if you're not going to use data analysis in your work in the immediate term, thinking about that more long-term machine learning type um, courses may be very useful to you in some applications. Okay. So let's go back. Our goal was to define a successful computational scientist. Like I said, I'm not sure I was gonna do that. So we talked about the life cycle of computational science and very abstract tools just to give you the, the 40,000 foot view at each stage. But if we're gonna have this goal of what's a successful computational scientist, how do we measure that success? Who has ideas? Number of publications, okay, good. What else? Number of satellites successfully shot down from the sky. Have we been successful? Very good. What else? Yeah. Okay, so informing the public, informing our, the broader community outside of computational science, okay? By number of citations, though. Oh, yeah. What else? Grants, that's a good one, that's, that's an important one. Um, anything else? Linpack performance, okay. Any others? These are all really good ideas, and what I want to point out is that they're all very quantifiable, they're measurable. So one thing that, that I encourage you to think about in your career is when you're defining what you're doing, figure out how you're gonna measure it. So something we often think about, putting my OLCF hat on, is we think about the largest, in terms of core count or in terms of number of nodes, simulation in the world. So that, you know, that's measurable. We think about the highest resolution simulation in the world. We think about the most efficient simulation or the LINPAC performance um, of a machine. I'm not sure, you know, these are, like I said, very quantifiable. I think the, the ones you all came up with are actually better. Uh, my concern 
my, my, my advice to you is if you start thinking in terms of these types of things, I'm not sure that's actually measuring the success of computational science. I would postulate instead that the most impactful scientific result, you know, actually using the, you know, the facilities, the, lar the, the computing that you have at your disposal, whether it be on your laptop or the largest computer in the world, the, the measure of our success ought to be the impact that we're having on a scientific domain, on computer science, on mathematics. So, Try not to get caught up, and I am very guilty of this, you'll hear it in the next session, I am very guilty of getting caught up in this type of quantifiable impact, of quantifiable result. When really, I think as computational scientists and domain scientists, we ought to be talking about the most impactful science, how our science is driving knowledge discovery, is driving engineering, is driving science. That should be the measure with which we evaluate ourselves. And things like grants are a, can be a measure of the impact we're having. Things like citations inside and outside of our community can be, can be a quantifiable measure of that impact. Okay, so I've kind of talked about the life cycle. I also wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the types of things I'm thinking about today. Um, and it was really interesting when Rob was talking we're thinking about a lot of the same types of things today, and what I want to hopefully inspire you to think about is these are the kind of things that are the problems that we're encountering today, and that I think you'll be encountering in the future. So one of the biggest things I'm thinking about is the changing architectural landscape, just like Rob talked about. So I'm particularly thinking about software application portability. So within the OLCF, we have lots of applications that come and run on Titan. Titan was very disruptive. You, know, you all may be young enough that GPUs are just in your blood, for, but for those of us that came from MPI and then OpenMP was a challenge, CUDA programming is a new challenge for us. And having to think about applications that can run on an architecture like Titan, which is heterogeneous, my application developers don't want to put a lot of time into developing for accelerators, then to go and try and run on a blue gene as well. They want to see performance, not just portability, but also performance across all these architectures, these different architectures that are emerging. Um, another thing I'm worried about is application readiness. So as Rob said, we are at the cusp of something new, something very disruptive. Titan, I think, was evidence of that, but I think there's more disruption coming. So ensuring that application programs, that people like you are educated on what's coming, that you're prepared for it, that we're thinking about all of the challenges that we're going to encounter. So being, ensuring that applications are prepared to take advantage of these coming architectures. And hand in hand with that is that ensuring that the tools that we use, the tools of our trade, so those libraries that I talked about, but also debugging tools, profiling tools, compilers, that they're ready so that we can take advantage of, of those tools which will enable our science on these next generation machines. Okay. Another thing I'm thinking about is algorithmic innovations needed for emerging architectures. So it's amazing how, how in sync Rob and I were. Um, fault tolerance and resilience. So something we see today on Titan is that the machines are growing, they're, they're becoming much larger. Uh, every year. So with Titan, we have about 18,000 nodes available for our users. That means that the time to failure, the time it takes for just one node of those 18,000 plus nodes to go bad, to stop working correctly, has shrunk. Um, it's shrunk quite a lot. So as algorithm developers and as application developers, we have to be prepared to guard against that. So we have to, um, in my opinion, it would be great if there were tools that will help us with that, and I think that our computer science friends are working on that. But until those tools are mature, we have to come with al up with algorithmic ways around um, when, a, when a node goes bad. And then big data. Um, it's today's buzzword. Uh, it's probably tomorrow's buzzword. It's gonna be our buzzword for a few, few years. But in the context of big data, the things I'm, I'm thinking about in particular are challenges our applications are having. So in terms of reading and writing simulation data. So many of our applications are starting to ingest experimental data, large amounts of experimental data. So helping them appropriately do that in the context of an HPC architecture, which has its own um, challenges when it comes to the file system that are separate from your laptops or your workstations. 
how they're going to efficiently write all the simulation data that they have. I'm also thinking a lot, a lot about the computing needs. What do data analysis machines look like in the future? Are they the same things as our big computer, our, our traditional predictive simulation computers? Or do they look very different? Do we have different needs for different tools that we need? Um, do we have different architectures that we're gonna need to solve these kind of analytics type pro problems? And then finally, integration of, of large experimental data into our simulation frameworks, as I said. Okay, so I always like to leave a few thoughts that hopefully you'll take home and kind of remember uh, as, we, as we leave here. So the, the take home thoughts from today are to kind of think about the life cycle of computational science. And so one, identify appropriate mathematical models. Don't oversimplify, don't overcomplicate. Um, leverage, this is probably the most important one that, that I wish I had known with, when I was in your seat. Leverage existing software libraries for these common computational kernels. Use those computational kernels as a way to talk between your domains so you can extract knowledge from some other, you know, in many cases in computational science, one domain has solved a problem and another domain doesn't even know about it. And these computational kernels or motifs can be ways to talk about um, these common problems and learn from other domains. Exposing parallelism, keeping up with current programming models will be very important now and in the future. And there, there, continue, there will be and will continue to be uh, application development challenges as we look towards these new architectures. Okay, so I have one final piece of advice as a practicing computational scientist, and that's that computational science in general is not practiced in a vacuum. It's not something most people can practice alone. It's something that we often do in large teams. Not always, I mean, again, this is a, an overgeneralization. But be prepared in your career to draw on other people's expert knowledge and skills. You'll have your expert knowledge, and there, but there will be areas where you don't have as much depth, and so draw on people's experience. And here's the advertisement. You thought it was gonna be an OLCF advertisement. Um, I learned very early in my career that my administrative assistant um, was someone I had to be really, really nice to. Um, but more importantly, your system administrators should be people you sh that you want to be best friends with. So, this was something I learned from Heather Mays, a fellow. There is actually a System Administrators Day, which is next Friday, June, July 25th. Say thank you to your sysadmin, because you always go to your sysadmin with a problem when something's broken. But if you tell them thank you, they might be your best friend. And when you really do have a problem, they'll be willing to uh, help save you from it. So say thank you next week. Some recommended reading, some, these are, um, papers that I took, I drew some of the topics from this for this conversation from. Um, I highly recommend everyone read it. I think this will be available on the web so you can, you'll be able to download this slide and look at it. But I'll take any questions or conversation that you all want to have. <laughs>